being a violated right here. So, sir, I wanted to know your opinion on this. Um, you, you cut out very slightly there, uh, sorry, when you were describing um, the two black holes colliding. Did you have much more to say after that? I, I think I missed the rest of that sentence. So, like, what I mean to say is when two black holes will collide and they are emitting gravitational waves, so those gravitational waves will carry the information of the black holes colliding. But if they are carrying the information of the black holes colliding, so the resulting black hole that will form, whose area will be larger than the sum of these two individual black holes. So that resulting black hole, we can get the information. It was formed by the gravitational waves by the colli uh, collision of two other black holes. While according to no hair conjecture, there is no way that we can ever gain the information of how a specific type of black hole was formed. So these two results are quite contradictory to each other. Yeah, that, that, that sounds interesting. I mean, I, I, I've never heard the no-hair theorem be described that way. So the no-hair theorem, I think, really precisely means that black holes depend on three parameters. Their yes, mass, sir. their spin, and their electric charge. Um, I, I haven't heard the statement that you can't learn anything about its, about its past. Um, so, um, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure that's a, a, a correct application of the no-hair theorem, because like you described, Gravitational waves provides very rich information about the two um, stars that merge, so two, two black holes that merge into one under black hole. Yes, and then also, the black hole that would be formed will be excited in, in a certain way, that will make gravitational waves. We can also um, potentially read that information. So I don't think there's a contradiction there. Um, yeah, sure. I haven't heard that, that, that before. So actually, I had learned about the no hair conjecture in Kip Thorne's book, that is Black Holes and Time Warps. And, and Kip claims that you can't learn anything about its past or, or its progenitor. Yes, sir. Okay, that's interesting. Um, I, I, I might need to read that argument, but, but I think what you described, Sirian, sounds correct. It, it sounds like based on gravitational waves, you can learn something about the two black holes that formed it. Yes, sir. And so, like, uh, there were a few other questions, like, since I have so many lots of questions and I never ever got a chance to clarify all of them. One of the questions that I thought was, according to Einstein's principle of relativity, again, two inertial reference frames cannot be discriminated against each other. That is, we can vote equally for both of them. The measurements carried out in uh, both the frames is equal in both of them. That is, it is not like we are getting the same equal value of length or time or something like that. But we can claim that both are equally right. But sir, if this is really true, and any certain object, any certain reference frame is accelerating compared to rest of the universe, then we can feel the acceleration. Yes. Well, we cannot feel the speed, but we can feel the acceleration. And that will be due to a kind of pseudo force as described by Sir Isaac Newton. So when we can feel the acceleration, so we certainly know that we are in motion. But so here, I guess that principle of relativity is kind of being violated that two reference frames well, we can claim that both are equally right, while here what we are getting is that actually one is in motion and other is in the state of universal rest. I think that's right, Serene. I think you've got to be very careful about when you talk about an inertial reference frame, right? because in reality, we, we live on Earth, the Earth is rotating, um, that's not an inertial reference frame. Right? The Earth is also traveling with respect to um, the Sun. Uh, and the sun is 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 in the middle of a gap, you know, in the middle of our solar system. And the solar system is moving in a galaxy. So they're really, you really be very careful about an inertial reference frame. Something Einstein discovered back in 1915 was this this statement that you're describing. But I think more recently we've we we sort of grappled with it, and tried to understand what what it means in a more modern context. And I think one way in which people describe it is that any um, well, there's what's known as the principle of equivalence, which is this idea that we're standing yes, on Earth, the Earth has a gravitational force, which is keeping my, my, my feet to the floor. But also, I can imagine that I'm in a lift, and, and that lift, say, is being, is being lowered, per se, and at the same acceleration. Now, I can, can't conduct any non gravitational experiment in, those two, in these two situations that will tell me the difference. And that's one statement of the principle 